larger portion of CISOs that are on the market for the first time. Uh, we estimate about 30% uh, more uh, that are active. Act Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. As we start, can you talk a little bit about your role um, and maybe a little bit of your background? Yeah, thank you for having me, Misha. Uh, so I'm uh, Michael Piacenti, I'm the managing partner of an executive search firm called Hitch Partners. Um, we are nearly exclusively focused on the uh, executive search function of CISOs, uh, their deputies, and uh, the, the security leadership function. Uh, we also manage other searches in the product and uh, infrastructure operations and engineering functions, um, but primarily in the CISO space. I understand. I understand. And given your very specific focus, I imagine you have, you have a, a unique kind of position, a unique view on the market. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, it's a strange market. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, layoffs continuing, um, yet there's also a lot of activity. Uh, there's selective hiring, um, and we're continuing to see some strong CISO opportunities for job seekers out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say that it's more competitive and crowded uh, than it has been in past years, probably the most that we've seen. There's a larger portion of CISOs that are on the market for the first time. Uh, we estimate about 30% uh, more uh, that are active, active meaning that they are uh, actively looking for roles. They're not proactively kind of sort of looking around, um, uh, looking around, meaning they see the writing on the wall or they may want to look at a change. It's been that time. Uh, they've been there three or four or five years. These mm -hmm. are active candidates that are um, currently out of work um, or soon to be out of work. And um, uh, that number is usually hovering around three or 5% uh, in the CISO space. And this mm -hmm. last two quarters, we've seen them jump up to about 30% or so. Um, and the proactive candidates um, sitting at around you know eight to ten percent on average. So if you add those together, you're looking at about forty percent of the market is either proactively or reactively looking, um, which is uh, definitely the highest we've seen. Um, and uh, I also think the other thing that we're seeing is the quality of the roles um, that we're seeing is not as strong. Um, there's there's more companies uh, and and organizations looking for CISOs um, than we have seen before. Uh, but that does not necessarily translate into the quality of roles that are available. In fact, most of these roles that we talk to, we would put them in the category of virtual CISO or fractional CISO, a large percentage of them. They are not um, what many uh, maybe in your organization, in your, um, your, your program would consider as full-time CISO roles. Um, they're hiring the first security officer or first security individual. It can be a little bit tactical. It can be compliance only. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that go on there, but um, uh, but there's a lot of activity. Yet there's a lot of um, there's a lot of hurt out there as well. I understand. It makes a lot of sense. In the past, I've seen people off on stage at RSA or Black Hat talking about uh, quoting essentially that the biggest problem uh, facing the industry is lack of talent, and someone was bringing up stats in, in terms of tens of thousands of cybersecurity roles, racks that are not being filled. Maybe they're more junior uh, granted, but it seems like up until now, at least, the, the feeling in general was that there are more roles than there is talent. But you're essentially, you're saying that, that the tides have turned and now up to 40% of all cybersecurity executives uh, actively or passively are looking for, for a new role. Do you think yeah. it's? A, do you think? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, do you think it's a it's a uh, function of the current economic environment when when companies are trying to do more with less and they they limit the scope of those roles or like what what is contributing to this similar yeah. recent, recent phenomenon? Sure. Yeah. Th there's a lot of nuance here, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, first, I would say that. Um, you know, you have uh, an environment where uh, for the first time people have been looking for the last 10 or 15 years, uh, they've been in their role for quite some time, they've built a great program, um, uh, and 
the companies that are making the majority of the companies that we see that are making changes that will affect the CISO's direct role um, are really organizations that are either transforming into more of a software model. Um, they are looking at their traditional businesses and saying we need to shift. Um, and sometimes they're using this change as a way of transforming. Um, so we've seen a several we've seen several companies. Um, that have moved on from their CISO claiming, you know, financial uh, distress, and yet then hiring a new type of CISO um, in 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 replace of that individual um, or that program. So either way, though, we're seeing the, the first time. This is the first time since at least we've been in business that we've seen CISOs directly affected, uh, their positions directly affected versus their programs, their um, their teams that have also been affected in past recessionary periods. Um, we are uh, seeing the, the CISOs uh, being affected directly for the first time in mass. You know, there's always, like I said, a three to five percent. This is a much bigger jump. Um, and the, it's, what's interesting is uh, the nuances uh, I mentioned earlier is there's actually two very distinct CISO markets. And this is the part that I think we need to keep in perspective. You mm -hmm. have an enormous uh, population of enterprise security and corporate security uh, talent out there that is coming from a more traditional security um, line of sight um, directly to the CIO, for instance, uh, it is a deputy under the CIO, even if it is another C-level organization mm -hmm. or C-level individual. And those uh, individuals are more on the IT security, um, SaaS, you know, moving cloud applications and really focusing on the compliance standards. It's usually larger organizations um, and those are the candidates we are seeing um, affected the most at this time. You mm -hmm. have another population of CISOs that are more the newer, newer CISO or newer company CISOs. And they are, these are uh, kind of cloud native. They're building, maintaining, managing, servicing their product exclusively through the open uh, public cloud. Uh, there was no infrastructure. Uh, there was no IT department. Um, they're actually, in many cases, uh, managing the IT department. Um, about 90% of our searches in cloud native actually manage IT today. And so that 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 category of, of company and organization is actually still in growth mode, um, interestingly enough. And, and so we're still seeing those companies uh, thriving um, for the most part. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of pain in some of the tech companies, but there's a whole hand, a huge handful of them that are continuing to grow. So it's it's really the tale of two um, candidates, and and they're both CISOs, and they're both incredibly talented. And our job recently is just trying to figure out how to bridge the gap so that we can make sure that all CISOs have an opportunity out there, whatever it is. I understand. I understand. And then this number, the forty percent, is it across the board, or you see certain industries uh, being impacted more? I don't know financial services, healthcare, kind of the usual suspects. Or yeah, it's, it's a great question. I actually haven't gotten too granular into the. I probably should uh, into the vertical concentrations. I think. Um, We've seen less on financial services as a whole. Um, we have seen um, a number of, and again, this is reflective of the candidates that are just being introduced to us. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. if this is reflective of the whole market, but um, those that are in um, uh, certainly uh, some more modern technologies in the crypto space, we've seen that uh, affected digital health um, has definitely taken a hit. Insurance, um, manufacturing, uh, automobile, Mm -hmm. um, in some transportation. So it is kind of all over the board. I wouldn't particularly concentrate on one industry or the other, but um, there's also some industries that are continuing to flourish as CISO opportunities as well. So mm -hmm. I understand. I understand. And it's certainly, uh, it's apparent that some of, some of those things that you're talking about, they're impacted by the current economic environment, kind of the headwinds and, and uh, a lot of companies are, restructuring downsizing and or being asked to do more with less so to speak so the the question that i often hear from cso's is in terms of ex what to expect going forward do you see those changes being structural meaning do companies uh, fundamentally shift the way they do business whether it's by going to the cloud that fundamentally changes the need for a certain skill set or do you think this phenomenon when uh, there are so many companies downsizing or structuring so many CISOs looking for a job, do you think this trend will reverse once the country kind of goes from 
recessionary environment to more kind of steady uh, steady state or growth growth environment? Do you think this trend will reverse? Yeah, that's such an amazing question. So I, I will say that um, the the searches that we are seeing right now are companies that are uh, either they're they're fit into three categories. They're high growth uh, venture backed companies um, that are uh, on their way to uh, an IPO or an acquisition spree. Um, uh, you know, IPO obviously right now is not. Uh, you know, flourishing, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but we do see those high growth uh, environments. We also seeing private equity companies making um, uh, a play on a particular uh, platform, um, and then thus acquiring multiple competitors, um, building out a robust uh, solution, uh, bringing on a uh, a new CISO uh, archetype for that. And we're seeing the uh, smaller and mid sized enterprises, and even some larger enterprises, but uh, in in the companies that we typically work with, certainly mid sized enterprises sort of re transforming their model towards a more digital solution. Uh, perhaps they acquired digital assets uh, companies in the past and, and the last few years have been working to integrate them. And now for the first time, we're seeing the revenue contributions shifting towards that digital product versus the more traditional products that they've had, which is causing a change in the types of candidate profiles that they're looking at. Um, I think that uh, on the on some of the ones that I mentioned that uh, when we when we interview these candidates uh, that are coming in uh, that are active, uh, a common scenario is that they've uh, been you know that they've been moved out of their role um, in exchange for uh, a you know battlefield promotion of someone on their team, a senior manager or director moving into that role purely because of financial co um, considerations. So they looked at the most expensive and um, uh, most senior person in the organization and said, you know, we probably can handle this with a, um, you know, now that it's a settled program, we're, we're settling, we're handling this with, um, you know, one of the other managers in the organization. So we're seeing that mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, we're seeing a, kind of a retooling of, um, you know, into what they would consider a more modern architecture at CISO. Mm -hmm. I understand. I understand. You mentioned that oftentimes, CISOs are starting to look for a job for the first time in five or 10 years. So I imagine certain skills are maybe a little bit rusty compared to kind of the technical, <laughs> technical expertise. Recently, from what you've seen, what are the top three mistakes people make when they're starting their search? And kind of, I guess, on the flip side, what will be your recommendation of what they do uh, now to stack the deck in their favor a little bit? Yeah, I, I, this is a great uh, question and topic. Um, I think the first thing, um, my advice to everyone that I've spoken to is, um, that especially those that are active on the market uh, for the first time. I mean, this is um, the first time they may have been looking for a role in 10 years. They have not practiced this muscle. Um, there's not a lot of memory there. Um, so the advice I like to give them, I'm not sure if it's great advice, but I do give it anyway, is that, you know, look, First, be good to yourself, right? Um, you're not supposed to be good at this. <laughs> I am. <laughs> My team is. Other other companies that we do this, we're supposed to be, you know, helpful. Um, it's a very competitive market. Um, most of you have uh, not experienced this recently, and um, and so one of the mistakes that I see is the first thing they'll do is they go apply to everything on LinkedIn. Um, and you know, one thing you need to understand is that uh, if you're posting a position publicly and you're a public company, um, it's probably a, a formality. Um, you know, we have situations where people are, you know, deflated because they've posted their resume or they've sent their resume into a posting and they notice that there's, you know, 1,200 applicants. Um, of course there is, right? So that's because it's out in the public domain, everyone's going to be applying. And so um, it's not so much a mistake to get your resume in front of companies. Um, LinkedIn does work uh, well. Um, it's just very crowded. And so using your network, one of the things that CISOs downplay or forget um, is often, and we have to remind them, is that um, you have incredible networks. You have all of these consultants and vendors and people that work for you um, that really are there um, as your allies and can help you. They're great with information, salespeople. People who get a bad rap for constantly uh, badgering CISOs also are great resources on the other side because they know all of um, what's going on in these companies. There's a trust circle there. And of course, they're going to be motivated to make sure that you get into a new organization. But going through the front door anymore, you know, through a LinkedIn post, the percentages, it, I have heard success, but the percentages are so low um, that it's often a mistake uh, to just focus on that. But again, 
this is not something that everyone knows how to do, so we don't expect it. So, you know, when we're in, in touch with folks, we're really just trying to help them, ask them what they've done so far and understand what's the best way to do it. Um, the, the advice I would give is when you're when you're evaluating an opportunity, you need to recognize what good looks like. Uh, this is if there's one thing that we can differentiate as our business model and why companies would hire us. It's not for our network or how fast we are. Um, they say that, but it's really because we we understand uh, who the candidates really are. We understand who they as a company really are, and we understand what good looks like um, to make this process a lot more efficient. Um, and so I would offer that to um, to the CISOs. Um, it's it's often up to you to figure out how much meat is on the bone in this opportunity. How much are they willing to sponsor? What is their budgets? Um, what is their um, focal points? What does success look like 18 months from now? Not three months, not five years, but what does success look like in a, in a time period that you can really point to and say, ah, the GRC program needs to be here. The security operations program needs to be here. The outsourcing piece, the MSSPs need to be here. So if you really drill down on that, um, you can find out where they are. Um, and, and, and I think just there's some techniques around that we can certainly drive into, but um, that that's something that I would uh, definitely focus on. Um, a, a couple other things is, uh, I think for CISOs that are just getting into it, expect that these interviews, um, assuming you get to an interview, um, that they're going to be uh, longer and they're probably going to be more of them and they may be inconsistent. One of the things that we do, we, we run about 30 to 40 CISO searches a year, um, we, but we talk to about 200 companies a year. And um, in doing so, um, we understand that a lot of those, uh, that delta between those two are, are non-CISOs. They don't have the C, they don't have the O. <laughs> and uh, But we still talk to a lot of those companies and we have this process we call interviewing the interviewers, which we've been very vocal about. Um, and we interview uh, the executive team and anyone that's going to be influencing this role and touching this role. Um, we find out about 70 to 80 percent of the interviewers that we speak with uh, require some sort of interview training. Um, they're either approaching the problem uh, at a very tactical level. Um, they may not understand what a CISO truly does. They're, um, you know, they may not be calibrated. Um, they may not have any interaction. And so when we see it for each of our searches, we know that the candidates out there who don't have someone like us or another executive search firm or someone else guiding them, they're going to run into that problem. And it's kind of a buzzsaw. Um, and so understanding um, what an interview cycle will look like, what kind of uh, commitment on time, uh, what are the rounds, where are they in the rounds? Uh, these are all things to be extremely curious about. Um, and so we, we do it in our process um, because I really don't like saying to people, well, Michael, why, why, did they, uh, why are they looking for this role? Um, why is it important? The worst answer I could give is, well, they retained us, so they must be serious about it. Uh, no one wants to hear that. If you ever hear that from me or anyone else, run the other way. But it's it's really up to the CISO sometimes um, for us and for us to tell what's really going on in the environment. But it's also up to the CISO to to really figure out where uh, you know what is this opportunity and what does it look like. I understand. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, you mentioned that uh, this forty percent is kind of split in a certain way between CISOs who are kind of passively looking, uh, they realize that their tenure, the current company is coming to an end, but they may or may not have visibility in terms of when it's gonna happen, but they're looking for, passively looking for a new opportunity versus someone who through restructuring or some sort of adverse uh, course of events are no longer employed and they're actively looking, looking for a job. For those who are passively looking, it's always a very sensitive, topic in terms of how to go about it so that the word doesn't get back to the company that they're looking, uh, the, the company will start uh, uh, questioning loyalty and and they may find themselves out of the job much sooner than, than they expect. And so it's it's obviously everyone has the work ethic and, and I would imagine that at director VP, C-level, their mind is in the right place and, and obviously they'll not do anything uh, they'll regret later, but for those who are passively looking, what would you suggest in terms of the way that they go about it? What are some of the ta tactics and what, what people need to keep in mind when they do those passive searches? Well, uh, well, when we're doing the, well, the actual instruction of passive searches, I mean, I can provide um, some insight as to how I might 
guide them to better their personal brand, right? Um, that's probably the biggest thing that we focus on um, is that when you're looking at uh, passively um, getting your name out there, making sure that you're, um, that you're considering opportunities, uh, all these searches are confidential for the most part, or, or they're not, a lot of the ones that we work on, they're, they're not posted, uh, none of them are posted. So they're uh, private searches um, that you know are found out through Slack channels and, and organizations like yourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, and so it, it moves pretty quickly. Um, but one of the biggest uh, areas that I, we try to focus on with with candidates is to kind of work on their personal brand. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's incredible, incredibly important. Um, and and so what does that mean? Um, it means that uh, uh, in this day and age, uh, and and you should know that we don't uh, we don't promote the use of resumes uh, in any of our searches. We usually don't send resumes to our clients. Uh, we talk about our candidates live. Um, and, and we do not provide resumes. We provide a storybook uh, or a storyboard. We call it a tile. And it kind of walks through the journey of someone uh, also looks at the matching criteria and any gaps there might be. We, we, uh, we kind of talk through that. Each candidate presented about 10 or 15 minutes worth of discussion. So, uh, so when we look at uh, how, can, how clients are viewing um, candidates today, if it's through something like us, we will always have a discussion. Um, but the first place that someone will look um, at, at a candidate's uh, background is LinkedIn. And mm -hmm. so uh, in order to know that, it's not usually a resume anymore. It's LinkedIn. The first thing you're going to do is open up your LinkedIn profile. The first thing we, we, we want uh, a client to see is what the candidates, what those CISOs are talking about, what they're interested in, what they're passionate about. And so um, as a thought leader, um, if you're presenting information, uh, if you're uh, talking to an organization, if you're working through any kind of detail um, that is in the community, um, it should be up there on LinkedIn so that the person that's evaluating is seeing artifacts of what you're passionate about. Um, and it, it cannot really be forced either. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of, uh, there's a dynamic out there called the celebrity CISO, right? That posts every day, nothing wrong with that, right? And they're trying to get their name out there, but eventually it, um, eventually it sort of gets uh, diluted over time. And so you want to be careful about how much you're talking about, but you do want to talk about things that are passionate. Um, so if you're passionate about DevOps, for instance, or, or uh, a particular technology, um, you can really post about that uh, and ask questions, be curious, bring other people into the fold, start a, start a conversation. Um, and, and I think the biggest advice I can tell on, on, on personal branding is to pick something that actually will cross the chasm of uh, from outside the CISO community. CISOs are incredibly good at entertaining other CISOs on topics, <laughs> naturally. It's a great community. It's an amazing community. It's why we're in the community. Um, we love that the interaction, the collaboration, you do not see this level of collaboration in any other um, any other industry at this at this size. Uh, you, you know, Alfinia is a great example, right? Um, the, the number of um, members you have and how well they collaborate uh, is a great example. So, um, but but being able to say, okay, where are the groups of CFOs and chief legal officers and CEOs uh, and investment partners that I can get the word out to about this critical uh, risk to the business impact? That is very important and uh, very focused on in, in a personal branding setting. Mm -hmm. so. it, makes, it makes a lot of sense. It, and I noticed that some, and I know exactly what you're talking about, the celebrity CISO, it's, it, it's, certainly, it's certainly out there. And some CISOs, they are very prolific in terms of the content that they create. It's LinkedIn posts and, and speaking at conferences like RSA or Black Hat, and it's uh, books and articles and, and participating in local chapters of various uh, professional organizations. What, from the employer perspective, what would have the biggest weight, I guess, in terms of the type of, uh, the type of content and the type of uh, the building blocks of this uh, personal brand, what carries the most weight? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I um, what I, what I can tell you um, that the rub there with a, and a, you know the, the, if you're out there posting and doing everything for the community, um, bravo because that is amazing. We we need you out there. And so nothing nothing against celebrity sisters whatsoever. I think it's incredibly important. The, the thing that they need to understand when they're actually actively looking 
for a role is that the more content you present that is um, sort of in the ether and a higher level and talking about um, less specifics, less examples, is that uh, your reputation or, or your brand reputation, I should say, um, by someone who doesn't yet know you, who's viewing you for the first time, may come to the conclusion that um, you are more interested in um, uh, in the kind of outwardly facing part of the um, of the job than you are operationally focused. And I will tell you that most of the roles that we have, I didn't mention it earlier, but most of the roles that we see right now are in a state of we need things to get done. Um, we have a list of items that um, uh, uh, disabling us from growing into a particular market or um, uh, penetrating a different uh, client set, a different industry. And so they really do have uh, a number of um, of non-strategic, more tactical items, and that's operationally focused. Uh, it could be a strategic hire they need to make uh, to get into the cloud environment, for instance. Um, but whatever it is, it's it's really focused on a um, a need to make sure that this person, we call it yo-yoing, and uh, the person really needs to be able to uh, show that they can be hands-on uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean coding. I want to clear, clear that up, but they need to be hands-on. Um, they need to be willing to get into the weeds, uh, even if it's a very high level. So, so um, but they also need to talk about the strategic business impact and being able to enable the business uh, to, to, to do their jobs. Um, and so, um, so having too much on a uh, LinkedIn profile, for instance, can lead to the example of wow, this person doesn't seem like they're operationally focused. They, they look like they're amazing on this other external facing piece. They'll be great with clients, but we actually need an operator too. Mm -hmm. And that inability to show that you can yo-yo can sometimes be a detriment to a candidate. I understand. It makes sense. Uh, Michael, I know we're coming up on time. A couple couple last, last questions. One sure. is, you mentioned in the beginning, uh, you said that because of this kind of upheaval in the market and so many people looking, uh, it's really competitive out out there. What some of the trends you're seeing in terms of compensation, and with within that kind of the implied question, how flexible should CISOs be when looking at various opportunities? Maybe slightly smaller company, slightly more junior position, slightly less attractive comp. Um, what what are your suggestions in terms of how much they should or should not compromise? And and how how they should think about it strategically so that they don't um, I guess sell themselves short but also let go of opportunities that that will grow into something bigger down the line. Yeah, good question. This could be an entire uh, other podcast. Uh, <laughs> but, um, well, I I will say that uh, one one I'm, I'm not a big proponent of um, of watching CISOs take a lesser role. Um, for the sake of it, uh, I would rather teach them and guide them as to how to go get that dream job um, that they've so much earned, right? The progression of a CISO is definitely up and to the right. Um, and they have mostly, um, with few exceptions, they have mostly uh, created a level of higher emotional intelligence, higher um, organizational design, understanding, a higher level of board interaction. Everything in the CISO's world over the last five or six years has grown and matured, and they well deserve that next challenge, right? So um, it's frustrating to see CISOs that need to take a lesser role um, because they have to. If they choose, uh, there are some CISOs that consciously decide, you know, I'm, I'm actually interested in more of the operational side. I want to do the people management side as much. And maybe there's a, a kind of two in the box idea there. Someone can be the, the, the externally facing strategic face and I'll be the operational face. That that is that is in a scenario we see, um, but for the most part, I think um, it's really trying to teach them uh, and guide them how to negotiate, um, you know, in and, and how to get themselves prepared and uh, presented for these uh, for these next opportunities. Um, we have seen uh, situations where um, candidates have walked into negotiating. Um, this is one thing I covered on a recent podcast is they've walked in uh, with, you know, here's the list of things that I need to see, not demands, but here's the criteria I need to see. And I think one thing CISO should understand when negotiating is that um, uh, one size does not fit all. Every company has a different aspect, a different view. Um, equity right now is seen completely different than it was this time last, last year. Um, the value of equity, um, the value, the total compensation for CISOs across the U.S. and in Europe has 
has gone actually in the U.S. and Europe has gone up, up a little bit and in, in the, the U.S. has actually gone down um, slightly. Um, that is mostly because of the equ equity situation has also decreased. Uh, I think the NASDAQ is down uh, significantly double digits, uh, well, double digits as, as well as the S&P. So CISOs have fared well in, in that they've only seen a small single digit decrease, um, but it is there. So I think we just have to keep in mind that, um, that every negotiation is going to be different. Every company needs to be treated different. A lot of CISOs will walk into an environment and just think, well, here's the package I want to see. And I, uh, it's just something we would warn against. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Michael, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Where our listeners can, can find you? What's the best way to get in touch? Sure. Um, yeah, just a quick plug. We did this, uh, our national compensation survey that's available on our website. So to your point or your last question, there's some really interesting trends in there. And we always love to mm -hmm. hear from people, from uh, CISOs and others as to what else we should be concentrating on. So that's uh, there. That's at uh, www.hitchpartners.com. Um, and you can just get in touch with me via email or LinkedIn. Um, I'll make sure that information is available. But we really appreciate being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Misha.